Have your Bibles open them to Psalm 42. Psalm 42. Uh, in the bulletin, it does tell you we will be in Psalm 51, but I'm going to be gone next week with the youth on a world changers trip, so it won't be till the following week after that that we'll do that passage. So, uh, but if you want to be reading ahead, Psalm 51 is the next one after this one. So Psalm 42, it's interesting. Uh, it's uh, the title of the sermon is Emmanuel. You would think that that's something around Christmas time, um, but I think it's something that we forget that he's not just Emmanuel at Christmas time. He he is Emmanuel. God with us. We don't have to wonder where he's at the other 364 days of the year when it's not Christmas. He is with us. And so as we read through Psalm 42, that's the amazing thing about the writer of the psalm. He knows this. He knows this because things after thing is going to come at us. Like waves at the beach, the next thing and the next thing and the next thing is going to come. We're going to face these things. They're going to Hit us in the face, they're going to overwhelm us at times, as it says in here, the breakers beat against me. The waves cover over me, as it's going to say in the passage. And so as we're thinking about this week, about how heavy it is to think about what's going on in this person's life, and we're not sure, this, this could be David. This could be David, and some people estimate that this is David running from Absalom, his son, who's trying to take him over and kill him. And so as David is running from his son... It's possible that he wrote this because of the landmarks that are given to us in the passage, uh, the mountains that it talks about and the, the valley it's talking about. So there's a, there's a perspective here that he's running for his life. He's running from his enemies, and then he's writing this uh, in this perspective, that he has fled Jerusalem. And that's why it does make sense possibly to be this case, that he fled Jerusalem, and that's why he's waiting to come back. So as we read it, that's a possibility for who wrote it and why he wrote it. And as I was thinking about this, it hits home for those of us who struggle with depression, anxiety, who have wrestled through something hard in our life, again, which is everyone. But I was thinking about this, and then the statistic came across uh, my timeline, that 43,000 deaths a year by suicide before COVID, and that number is going up. I have a cousin who committed suicide. He was my closest friend. Spent all that time together, never knew it was coming. Still don't know. Still don't understand. It hits me all the time. Suicide is the second leading cause of death ages 15 to 44. It's estimated that last year, and I feel like this is a really low number. Okay, so when I read this number, don't think that's a high number. It is a high number. But it's estimated that last year, 17.3 million Americans had at least one bout of deep depression. 17.3 million Americans, at least one bout of deep depression. So as we're in this passage, be careful not to think about this as a self-help thing. When we read scripture, it's not a self-help. It is the Lord. It is dependence on the Lord. It is crying out. It is being real about our emotions. I love the Bible. I love the Word of God. I love the Word of God for a lot of reasons, but I love the Word of God and sharing the Word of God with people and the confidence I have in the Word of God because you don't have to sugarcoat it. It's not a once upon a time story. It didn't leave any of the messy stuff out. There's messy people, messy situations, and there are people who are considered to be after the own heart of God who are crying out in their despair, depression, sorrow, anxiety, darkness. I love that we have that example for us, and they didn't leave that out because we'd be in a world of despair, wouldn't we, if we didn't have something to go to to go, okay, this is normal, but there's a God who's greater than our normal. And we can rely on him. So here it is that God is our Emmanuel. So if you're able to stand for the reading of Psalm 42, please stand with me. If you're not, that is okay also. Um, I'm reading from the ESV, and it'll be on the screen for you as well. The word of the Lord says this, Psalm 42. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night. While they say to me all the day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude-keeping festival. Why are you downcast, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, 
For I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon and Mount Mazar. Deep calls too deep. At the roar of your waterfalls, all your breakers and your waves had gone over me. By day, the Lord commands me his steadfast love. And at night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go on mourning? Because of the oppression of the enemy. As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me. While they say to me all the day long, where is your God? Why are you downcast, O oh my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Let's pray. Lord, as we uh, again come to this time of, of the sermon, we have worshipped you in praise. We have worshipped you in song. We have worshipped you in prayer, in giving. Lord, as we come to this time of the word, we pray, Lord, that we would worship you as we hear the word and let the word do the work to change us. And God, we pray that we would not be completely bullheaded against what it is that you would have for us this morning, but Lord, that you would overwhelm us and that you would change us. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. So as we're looking at 42, I wasn't going to add 43, but actually if you, they think that Psalm 42 and 43 were probably put together. And as you can tell, it's, it's very much done in a set and then rephrased again in a set. So we're not going to go necessarily verse by verse in that way just because we're going to repeat ourselves, but I'll bring things up as we go along as well. But the very first thing I want to get across, and I, we made this point last week, so I'm reiterating that, and guess what? We're building on Psalm 51 also. There's a reason why we're doing the Psalms that we are doing. We can't cover them all. And the order that we're doing in the men is important as well. So we're building to 51, and 42 helps us understand some really, really important things following Psalm 23. So the first thing is possible, I mean guaranteed, as a believer, there will be dark times. I mean, it starts out great, right? This is one we're familiar with. I'm surprised we didn't sing As the Deer Pants for the Water. I really like that last song, though. Because it starts out as the deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. That sounds awesome. That sounds poetic. This is going to be beautiful. Then, bang. It hits us. It goes right into the heaviness. I mean, I love that he says, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Obviously, this is a true statement. And, and, and again, one and two kind of build on each other. But then you realize how deep his longing and his soul is thirsting for God when you get to verse 3 and how heavy verse 3 is. I mean, I want to correct something real quick. And I hit on it last week, but... The world tells us, churches tell us, all the feel-good Facebook posts tell us that God will not give us more than we can handle. Wrong. God will give us more than we can handle. More than I can handle. It's going to happen. I mean, if you live a cushy life your entire life and never face something like that, I don't know where you live and what mental state you are in, but it's not here and it's not sanity, right? It's, it's heaviness at different times in our lives. And some of us have experienced deep, deep sorrow. I mean, I know some of you in this room, I've had, heard your testimony, I've heard the things you've talked about, the things you've gone through. You, you've experienced deep, deep sorrow. Some people have experienced deep sorrow. Some people have experienced sorrow. Praise the Lord that you have stopped at sorrow. And those people who have been through deep sorrow but are rooted in the Lord, I guarantee you that testimony has radically changed your life, though. Like I said, sometimes God puts you in the storm. I said this last week, God puts you in the storm. Sometimes he allows the storm that you've caused. The consequences of something you've done has caused the storm in your life, has caused the valley. But possibly he's led you to that as well. There is a possibility. I've foolishly in my own life made my camp in the valley at times. I've chosen to camp in the valley with my stupidity. And I stay there in my pity and my sorrow. One thing is true through all circumstances, though. Whether I'm standing on the mountaintop rejoicing or I'm in the depths of the sorrow, he is Emmanuel. The Lord is there. He is with us. 
We don't say that as a cliche or a slogan. I don't say, the Lord is with me, right? If you come from certain denominations, you might have said, the Lord be with you and with you, right? It's not just a phrase we say to each other. When that phrase first came out, that was in such a horrible, horrific time that literally what that meant was, the Lord be with you, knowing you were about to either die, get plagued, disease, something like that, the Lord be with you through that, and the Lord be with you through yours. It was an encouragement with an understanding that we're all going to go through it. He's not absent from the storm. Throughout Scripture, we see men and women who are in trouble lament their trials. So it's not an asking. The Bible doesn't say, you should grin and bear it. You should whistle happily through your trials and sorrows. No, there's a whole book called Lamentations. Like, you, you can cry out to the Lord. Like, that's a good thing to do. But the prophets, I mean, there was prophets whose job literally was to bring bad news. Can I bring good news? No. You, you get to tell bad news your whole life. Do I get to see the fruit of the warnings? No. It's going to happen like 700 years from now. Oh, okay. All right. Leaders, disciples of Christ, the apostles, Christ himself endured, faced all kinds of things. So we see people in trouble. We see them lament. We see them cry out. Even Jesus' words, which again, we, we, sometimes people take it the wrong way, but when Jesus even says, Lord, if, if it all possible, let this cup pass from me. It's, it's Christ crying out to the God. So in this world, you will have trouble, as John 16, says. Oh, that's, that's uplifting. But in this world, you will have trouble. On the screen I have for you, Lamentations 3, 13 through 20. This is powerful, powerful stuff that goes right along with our passage. He drove into my kidneys the arrows of his quiver. I have become the laughing stock of all peoples, the object of their taunts all day long. He has filled me with bitterness. He has seated me with Wormwood. He has made my teeth grind on gravel and made me cower in ashes. My soul is bereft of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. So I say, my endurance has perished, so my, has my hope from the Lord. Remember my afflictions and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. We're going to finish that later because it gets better. But you can see the pain in that. You can see the sorrow in that. You can see the heaviness in that, that, that God deals with us and deals in situations that are drastic at times. But God knows our des desperation too. He doesn't put us in the valley or the storm. And when I say he's there, remember last week I said, there's some people that feel like God is like the aloof shepherd. There's paintings, there's pictures I've been around people who would be considered shepherds. We call them farmers or whatever. But they just kind of stand around near where it's happening. But they're not directly involved with the happenings. And Jesus says, the sheep know my voice. A good shepherd smells like their sheep. A good shepherd smells like their sheep. Jesus knows. Kidner in his commentary, says the very presence of these prayers in Scripture is a witness to God's understanding. God knows how men speak when they are desperate. God knows. If you've ever cried out to God in the dark times, the pain, the sorrow, and you said, Lord, and then the rest of it was just tears and sobbing, he knows. Romans tells us that in the Spirit, cries out for us. He knows. He knows that in the midst of our crying out to him and in prayer to him, that if we're not binding things up, if you've got, we'll talk more about this in Psalm 51, but if you have sin or some sort of issue in your life that you have bound inside, that you have not confessed, you have not dealt with, you have not repented of, crying out to the Lord in repentance will bring comfort. And God's comfort is intentional in that. It's not a 
wish granted. His desire is comfort and peace. And our desire should be confession and repentance. And God puts these passages in the Bible for purpose. And I just love that. Hear the, psal- hear the heart of the psalmist here. It's a man who has an intimate relationship with God, but is walking through a dark time. Many will not even recognize when they are weak. Or if they do, they keep their, their pride keeps them from crying out to seeking to crying out to the Lord for answers or to cry out to the Lord their heart, and again, may not get the answers, but have given over to God what is on your heart and your soul. And throughout my life, there have been hard times. I can resonate with the psalmist here. It says, why are you downcast, O my soul? Have you been there? Yes, we've been there. Why are you downcast, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? I had the time, and I've shared a little bit with you, but I mean, literally reading this passage and then answering that with, you're a pastor, get it together. You're supposed to be living here. And you are here. Tears are my food. How many people did that resonate with? In my Bible, I have it circled. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God, but what I'm getting instead are the tears that have been my food day and night. What a heavy thing. The psalmist has been there. Multiple people throughout Scripture have been there. You've been there. I've been there. The tears are my food. Whether I've lost someone, maybe someone in my family has died and the overwhelming sorrow of that has hit me. Maybe life in general has become overwhelming and you're struck by anxiety and depression. Maybe your children have caused some sort of heaviness in your life that you are praying fervently for. But the tears that you've cried over that situation have been your food. It's heavy. He has to rally himself. Do you see this? Why are you downcast on my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God. That phrase there, that next sentence there, in the original Hebrew was not a, you know, eh, hope in God. It was a, wait a second. The answer is to hope in God. While the world mocks our God, it says it twice in here, that while my, while my enemies mock me, they say to me all day long, where is your God? Is that not our world right now? Where is your God? My God is not my sexuality. My God is not my look. My God is not my political party. I should hit both sides, not one or the other. My God is not this nation, even though I love it. I do believe it's the greatest nation on earth. My God is God. My God is the God, the one true God. My Savior is Christ and nothing else. So while the world openly mocks it, and it looks like it's winning a lot of times. Let's just be honest. It looks like the world is winning. We can resonate with the psalmist that said, my enemy lays up in green pastures, flourishes like a green tree. Does that sound right? Does that sound like sometimes the world looks like it's winning that the world, the enemy, looks like it's flourishing and we look like we're dying. But then the psalmist goes on to say, but they don't know true life and they wither away. The world openly mocks God and out of return, I hate it. I hate it. I hate when people, again, not the people, I hate it that this world is this way and my heart breaks for those who openly mock God and hate him. That actually burns and it should burn within us righteous anger. Not anger at the person, not attacking the person, but saying, look, I hate that you are thinking that way. I hate that that's what you believe because you are hating your only hope. I also hate when the religious side of people comes out and mock God as some sort of idol, 
instead of a living, true, working God. If you have a low or no view of God as part of your daily life, it's going to make the rest of your life heavy. If your view of Christ and God is Emmanuel, no matter what you're going through, it becomes really, really hard. People who go through heavy, hard things and don't have Christ, I don't know how they do it. I don't know how they do it. The weight that they are under without any hope would be like someone in the water as the Titanic is sinking. There's no hope. There's nothing coming for you but death. But what the psalmist is able to say here in the midst of their sorrow and pain is, but my hope and my salvation is my Lord. It's not meant to drive people away. If this is heavy, it's meant to be heavy. The Bible's heavy. If you're here and you're not a believer, this is not a me message to discourage you. It's a message to point you because guess what? You can agree that as a non-believer, you have also seen dark and heavy times. You as a believer have walked through sorrows. You as, a, as an unbeliever have seen terrible things or gone through things in your life. The difference is as we lean into our God as we walk through those, what are you leaning into other than yourself and more sorrow? The difference is God. It's always been God. It will always be God. When people talk about or make fun of God, they have no idea the experience of knowing God, truly knowing God. As the world has continued to mock and push against God, as places have tried to kill and discourage and thwart the work of God, God only continues to do the work more. As we sit here today in this comfy place in America, we are supposedly living out our lives as Christians. While the church is rapidly growing in Syria right now. Rapidly growing in Syria. Led by common people who have learned the word of God, who share the word of God, and in some cases rip out pages of the word of God to memorize and then pass to the next person so that they don't get caught knowing the word of God. In some cases, they bring somebody in to speak, and you have to be ready with the next speaker. I was even talking about somebody with this, this last week in a, in a missions effort in another country. That literally, you have to have a next person up because that person will be arrested, and eventually, we have another person ready to go. That's where, in the depths of sorrow, if you know that God is God, Emmanuel, you still worship and praise. A lot of people struggle coming to church if it rains. That's being honest. So we have the parable of the two builders in Matthew 7, right? We know the story, the fact that one built his house on shaky ground while the other one built it on a strong foundation. If you are without Christ, your foundation is sand. It's shifting, it's moving. It may stand up for a little bit, but as the storm rages, as the, to make it appropriate for this area, as the hurricane comes, your foundation is not going to stand. But the other one built his house on the rock. A firm foundation that when it came, it beat and it raged, but it didn't knock it down. Dark times are coming. Heavy times have come, will come, are going to come. But they never win if our foundation is truly in God, Emmanuel. So my question for the believers in this room is this. Question for believers in the room what are you doing daily to prepare for this? What are you doing daily to prepare for this? That sounds like a terrible question, right? What are you doing to prepare for the bad stuff? That just sounds bad. Just ask you a question like, are you prepared for the bad? But it's a sound question. It's a good question. It doesn't mean living in fear. You're not stay living inside of a panic room. You know, bad things are coming. Bad things are coming. It's a sound question from own experience and walking with other people that we should be ready and preparing our hearts and our lives daily for this. If dark times are coming and have come and will not stop, stop coming, why wouldn't you prepare? You prepare for vacation. You plan, you prep, you pack, you get ready, you save money, you do all kinds of stuff to go on vacation. You prepare for people to come over to the house. You at least throw things in a different room. 
so they won't see it. So why don't we spiritually daily get ready? Spiritually daily walk with the Lord. You can't come to church for a couple hours a week and hope that that takes care of the other six and a half days of your life. That doesn't work. Because when the storm rages, your foundation is terrible. So are you reading his word to build the storehouses of hope and peace? Are you reading his word and memorizing his word? Not just reading, memorizing his word. Are you listening to his leading in your prayer life and in your scripture reading? Or are you doing it to get through it? If you're ready spiritually, your response will be drastically different than those who are not ready spiritually. Soul is cast down, but the psalter here, the psalmist remembers, he is my rock and my salvation. If you're not sure, if you're a believer and you're like, I am a believer, I know I am. I do try to walk with God as much as possible, but I don't get how to be prepared. And again, my preparation is building up the storehouses, like I said, of hope and peace. So when the storm rages, I don't worry about the storm and the shaking and the issues. My eyes don't go to the waves as Peter's do in the boat, right? Or walking on the water. His eyes are on Christ, and as soon as his eyes worry about the waves, he begins to sink. So how do I prepare myself to keep my eyes on Christ even as the storm rages? It is my prayer time. It is my time in his word. It is working and walking alongside other people who can encourage and admonish, but also edify, build up, and encourage. It is being a part of a body and being more active than just someone who shows up and fills a spot. Right? Don't be the frozen chosen. The frozen chosen will fall in the storm every single time because you've built nothing to stand on. So if you're unsure how to do that, if you know you're a believer but you're unsure how to prepare, ask. I would love to talk to you about it. I'm not perfect in it. I've got some experience for myself. I've got some experience with walking people. I can encourage. I can do that. I can partner you up with someone. We can do a lot of things. But don't hold on to it. Don't stand there frozen. Don't live unprepared. It's the, place, it's the worst place you can be. So number two. It is in the dark times that we learn best about the grace of God. Why can't it be in the good times? Because we just don't. When we have lots of money in our pocket, we don't really worry about money. We don't think about it. We don't save it as much. We don't process the right thing to do with money. We usually tend to go, I have lots of money. Okay, when I was a kid, I mean, my mom would always be like, that, that money's burning a hole in your pocket. And I never really understood what she meant until I got a little bit older. I'm like, yeah, if I got 20 bucks for my birthday, I had to be at the store buying something. But you don't need that. You don't even really want that. I know, but it's $20. I have $20. I want to spend money. I've got to spend the money. We don't get or understand the grace of God, growth in God, deepness with God as much, we do some, in the good as we do in the dark. Do you see that the psalmist comes back each time to what he knows about God? In despair, in his despair, he has not lost his awe of God. And again, I say the word awe. It's not a wow. If you have been saved by Christ, you should be in awe. I used to say, man, that person has a crazy awesome testimony. What a radical salvation that was. And there are some, you hear their testimony, you're like, oh my goodness. Like, clearly, the, I mean, it's just amazing. It's amazing. All of our salvations are radical, though. All of them. We're all sinners in need of salvation. He has rescued us from our sin. That is radical. But I don't know if we're in awe of that enough. That we're in awe of God for being God. That he holds all things in his hand. I'm constantly reminded all the time that he holds all things, is all things, works all things out from end and beginning at the same time, lives outside of time, yet he entered time through Christ. Like, all of that. Uh, if that doesn't cause awe in you, read more. Read for depth. Understand where you stand as a sinner before a holy God and who that holy God is. Then you're like, oh. Then you get 
Isaiah 6. <laughs> Just kill me. Like I, I cannot stand here in front of you. And there is a resolve in the midst of desperation. He knows the steadfastness of God in the midst of this psalter. We see it, that he knows the steadfastness. That's why he's encouraging himself. He's literally reminding himself and encouraging himself. Hope in God. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 9, kind of gives us a little bit of a picture. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. That's to encourage us. That passage is, it's coming, but look, we are not fully struck down. Even in the midst of it where Paul says, to live is Christ, to die is gain, is a totally different radical concept. He's not our God because we are perfect in every way or we have it together. Because most of us would tell us, would be, if we were being honest, and said, hey, how was your week? Good, great, right? Some of you guys may have had an awesome week. That's fine, answer that way then. Some of you had a terrible week and you walked in and somebody said, hey, how was your week? Good, good, it's good. It was terrible and you know it. Maybe there's a sin in your life that keeps creeping up. Maybe there's a struggle. I don't know what it is. It was in your life. Maybe it was just a terrible week at work. I don't know. He's not our God because we're perfect and we performed well this week. So I can say, he is my God. He is our God because he is merciful and gracious and loving and caring and just and all those things 100% of the time, all at the same time. He is God. The psalmist in the midst of his despair longs for the Lord and to worship. You see, I long, I used to go with them to the procession of the house. I long, my soul thirsts for the God, for the living God. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so my soul pants for you, O oh God. Like, that's his heart. There's nothing else. He has come to a point where he's realized there's nothing else but you. And he doesn't want to just go back to the house to worship because it makes his life easier. He wants to go back to the house to worship. To worship. Spurgeon says this about the psalmist. Ease he did not seek. Honor he did not covet. But the enjoyment of communion with God was an urgent need of his soul. He viewed it not merely as the sweetest of luxuries, but as an absolute necessity like water to a deer. Is that what your life, is that what your heart is? I know that in the midst of sorrow, I journal like crazy in sorrow. I, I will write things out in sorrow. I read way longer in scripture. I, have a, I read quite a bit, but I read a lot longer when I'm in sorrow. All those things where I long after the thirst of God because I realize in the midst of it, he's all I have and he's all that matters. But do you come to the house of the Lord to worship, not because it's a luxury, but because you're an absolute necessity of God? Do you sing the songs because you want to worship the living and one true God? Do you pray as in a way to understand that he is the one true God and that it's the sweetest enjoyment of communion with him? In dark times, what are you desperate for? What does your soul pant for? Relief or God? Your circumstance to get better or God? Following Jesus doesn't mean you're going to be healthy, wealthy, or that everything goes right. All the disciples and apostles lived hard lives. All of them. They faced persecution and pain, and many of them died for their faith in terrible ways. So I don't get, oh boy. That was a whale of a problem. <laughs> My wife was embarrassed. <laughs> I, that's all I got. Where were we? All right. Yeah, there we go. Following Jesus does not mean you'll be healthy, wealthy, or that everything goes right. We, it just, we, it won't. 
the, the whole movement of this in churches makes me sick. That we're promising people that if you give or you do this or whatever else, we don't talk about tithing here. Like, you give, and then God will bless you with more stuff. He might. If you give, it should be worship to the Lord, or don't give. That's a scary thing to say. Most churches would never say that. And I'm not saying, look at me, I'm saying that. I'm telling you. For us, too, as people, my, my wife and I, if, we don't, if it's not worship, what are we doing? We're just filling out a check. Whatever we do, everything that we are, everything about us is for the Lord. And if we think that it's for what we can get out of the Lord, then all you're really doing is worshiping yourself, and God is your gene. The disciples in Acts were beaten to where their flesh was ripped off their bodies, literally ripped off their bodies where they could see the inner part of things, maybe even their spine, and they left worshiping for being counted worthy to suffer for the Lord. Again, I'm not saying you're supposed to enjoy the sorrow and the pain or look for it or go running towards it. But we should have a right perspective of it, that it's meant to refine us. It's meant to make us like Christ. Cry out in your pain. Call out to the Lord. Share your pain. Weep if that's what it is, come in here and weep if that's where the Lord has you that morning because of whatever's going on in your life. That's okay. You're not weird. We're not going to look at you. We're not going to point at you. We're going to come alongside you. We're going to love you. We're going to pray for you. But if that's where you're at, then come there. Come to the Lord with genuine worship. But never forget that God is eternally enough eternally enough. There's a man who is, his name is Alexander Soljanitsyn. He was in a Russian, he was in a Russian camp, work camp, dying bit by bit every single day. Wishing, actually, at one point to die. Wishing to die. Knowing that if he ever stopped digging, ever stopped working, they would kill him. So one day he decided, I'm just going to lean on my shovel and let them beat me to death. Because I'm done. I've had it. And Alexander says that one other prisoner, fellow believer in Christ, just reached over with his shovel and drew a cross in the ground and then quickly wiped it away for, because of being seen. They would be put to death. And Alexander said that it's a little reminder of the hope and courage we find in Christ. He found the strength to continue because a fellow believer cared enough to remind him of his hope. When hope is all, all there is, it is all we need. And he goes on to say this in his book. It was granted to me to carry away from my prison years on my bent back, which nearly broke beneath its load, this essential experience. How a human being becomes evil and how good. In the intoxication of youthful success, I had felt myself to be infallible, and I was therefore cruel. In the surfeit of power, I was a murderer and an oppressor. In my most evil moments, I was convinced that I was doing good while doing evil, and I was well supplied with systematic arguments. It was only when I lay there on rotting prison straw that I sensed within myself the first stirring of good. Gradually, it was disclosed to me that the line separating good and evil passes not through states, nor between classes, nor between political parties either, but right through every human heart. That is why I turn back to the years of my imprisonment and say sometimes to the astonishment of those about me, bless you prison. I have served enough time there. I nourished my soul there. And I say without hesitation, Bless you, prison, for having been in my life. It's in the midst of the trial, the fire, the fire that's meant to refine, that we truly start to see the changes that we are to make to be more like Christ. In fact, J.C. Rowell says, trials are intended to make us think, to wean us from the world, and to send us to the Bible and drive us to our knees. In the midst of the darkness, we can change and become more like Christ, more like God, if we are driven to his word and to our knees. 
2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. So we do not lose heart. Though outer selves is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. And God wastes none of it. In your pain, God has wasted none of it. Every millisecond of it can be used by him to do great things. Or it can be wasted by you and your pity and wallowing. Now, how can it happen? It's only when we have been deeply rooted in faith. Many will face trials and they're going to topple. Unfortunately, many will walk away from the faith because they never really had a genuine faith to be grounded in. As we read in Psalm 1, sink your roots deep into the living water. Prepare yourself for these days that are coming and the days that are ahead. If you're already in the midst of it, sink into him. And under God's grace, do this. One step at a time. One scripture at a time. One prayer at a time. There are no magic words to turn around an event or a situation. There are no words for that. But what you can do is you can take one step, one scripture, one prayer. I can't read the entire psalm. One scripture, one prayer, one step. Remind yourself constantly of your hope in the Lord as he does. Hope in God. Seek, pant, open your heart and soul to the Lord. Seek the Lord genuinely and then wait on the Lord patiently. Those who wait on the Lord will mount up with wings so that in the end, we know we have the last thing, which is hope. In the dark times, we grow like Christ, to be more like Christ, and in the end, we have a hope. We have a hope that we can share with others. We have a hope that we can lead others towards. We have a hope that we can grasp onto. Point three is hope. Okay. Though painful, the psalmist never forgets who his Lord is and where his hope rests. First thing we need to do is we need to notice the difference between day and night in verses three and eight. Do you see in verse three, what is he doing day and night? My tears have been my food day and night. Then look over at verse 8 and what the comparison there is. By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love, meaning God is over me. God's love is commanded over me as his. God's love is coursing through my veins because I am his. So by day, the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. Do you see the difference in hope there? Yes, we will go through moments where our tears are our food. But in those same moments, we should also be resolved in the fact that he is our God. He reigns over, he is sovereign over all, and he reigns over all. Because he says it again in 5 and 11, my hope is in God, he is my salvation. So we've been in many trials, but we have never yet been placed where we could not find that God is all that we need. You might say, oh yes I have. I've been there where God wasn't all I needed. I get that response. I really understand that response, too. I've been there where I thought, uh, I don't even think the Lord can deal with this one right now. But on the other side, on the other side of that pain, that sorrow, that deepness, that so whatever that it might be, on the other side, I realized it was him that I needed. He was never lacking. I was the one who was lacking in the midst of that sorrow and struggle. I look back, and it's that goofy poem about, you know, that I look back and I only saw one set of footprints, right? The sense of that thing is true. That in the midst of that, he never left me. And in some cases, he definitely carried me. And in some cases, he definitely dragged me. But he never left me. He never stopped caring for me. He never stopped calling to me. Our relationship with God gives no true hope if it's built on what we can get out of God. If your hope is that God will fix it and I can move on with life and be better, that's not a true hope. 
that will never be hope, and that will never cause peace. Because what we end up doing is we give God the credit in the good times, and we give God the blame in the bad times. So what we end up with is a pretty pathetic relationship with God. If you're a Christian, God must be preeminent. That means above all, outside of all, takes care of all. He's number one over all things. God must be preeminent in all circumstances for it to be about his glory. And it must be about his glory. If my hope is in the Lord no matter what, he will always be enough. No matter what the debt this world tries to count against you. No matter what debt this world tries to count against you, whether it's spiritual, emotional, physical, or tangible, our account in Christ will always be more than enough. No matter what you've gone through, Christ is enough. You can't obtain that mindset on your own and obtain that hope on your own that Christ is enough. It takes a relationship with God. It takes a relationship with Christ. It takes more than just saying you're a believer in Jesus Christ. Because again, if we have not built up the well of hope and peace and the ability to respond in Christ to our situation, then we will be crushed by our situation. One thing that helps me the most as I think about this and as I walk with him is that he knows. We'll finish with this. He knows. We have a God who knows. Not a God who guesses. Not a God who sits outside of time and thinks, man, I really wish they'd get this figured out. Or I just don't understand why these people are such a mess. We have a God who knows. Hebrews 5, 7 through 8. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears. To him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey. Being designated by God a high priest. Then you go on to Hebrews 4, 15 through 16. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. He knows. He's been despised. Have you been rejected? Christ was rejected. Have you faced deep sorrow? Christ felt deep sorrow and tears. We just saw that, but we've also seen in other places where he wept and he cried. Have you been abandoned? Christ was abandoned. Have you been betrayed? Christ was betrayed. Have you lost a loved one? Christ lost loved ones on earth. Are you tired? Christ was tired. Are you tempted? Christ was tempted. And so on and so on and so on. So we don't have this God or prophet like other religions do that they cling to and hope, hope in. That has done nothing, knows nothing, is not alive to start with, is not a true God to start with, but not only do we have the alive, real, true God that is out there on some sort of pedestal, we have the alive, true God who knows. Whatever you're going through, he knows. He's experienced it. So not only as the almighty, eternal God can he walk through it with you, but as God Emmanuel, who has walked in it, he can walk with you. Christ is Emmanuel. The psalmist looked forward to the Messiah, but we can know the Messiah. He desired to worship in the tabernacle, and we can go to the house of the Lord and worship the risen Christ. We have Christ, a direct mediator, a high priest. The one they hope for is the one that I'm grounded in, that my hope is in, that does not shift like sand, but is a firm foundation. God is near to the brokenhearted. He has not left those who are in him. And the last reading is, remember Lamentations earlier? Seem pretty depressing. Well, this is what Lamentations goes on to say at the end. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, my, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him. To the soul who seeks him, it is good that one should wait quietly 
for the salvation of the Lord. Whether you've gone through it in the midst of it or it's coming, where is your hope and foundation stand? Where is your peace found? Do you know Christ? And if you know Christ, how are you preparing your life, your family's life, those who you're in direct contact with, to stand firm in those moments? And if they don't know Jesus, what are you doing to tell them about Jesus? But if you're a Christian in here, I'm encouraging you and challenging you that you should constantly be filling the bucket in your life, not just for your not just for the bad times, not just for to be ready for the bad times, but for your everyday edification. You should be reading God's word in a deep communion and prayer with Christ. So that when those times hit, when I hit rock bottom as I have in my past, and you realize that Christ is all you have, you understand that Christ is all you need. It's not a saying, it's not a slogan. It is the Christian's hope that we can stand on. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this morning and your word. God, we, we are facing times. We are facing, have faced, will face, God. And we don't face them alone. Lord, I, I don't think I can explain it enough. I don't, I don't know if my heart is coming across. I don't know if your heart's coming across, but I just trust, God, that you're doing the work. I can't, say it with enough infliction. I can't say it loud enough. I can't say it long enough. It has to be your work, Lord. So I trust you in that. I trust you for those in this room that they have heard from you and that they will seek your face. Lord, if there's someone in this room that doesn't know you as their Savior, I pray, God, that they would seek you. I know, Lord, that in you they will find salvation in you alone. If they're lacking peace, they can't just want more peace. They can't just want more of good things or whatever it might be. The, the thing they're lacking is you. Lord, do the work on our hearts, whether we need to sit and pray where we're at, whether we need to come to the front, whether we need to come and ask about salvation, whatever it is, Lord. I pray that you would move mightily in those in, the, in this room this morning. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.